thank you. I love doing small groups, so that's awesome uh, because then it can kind of be a conversation, not a formal presentation. Um, so, you know, definitely just ask me questions um, and I'm going to be kind of just showing you guys some stuff. So, uh, all right. I am not the polished speaker that you are, Erica, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do what I can, Sim. Um, all right, so this talk is what I've been working on for the last year, uh, which is towards an open source tool stack for e-commerce search. And um, I had a Explorer project, kind of like our equivalent of Innovation Time, Erica, uh, in the beginning of the year to kind of think about like, how do we get offline and online testing of relevancy to work better? Um, and so I was messing around with some of the open source projects out there, uh, Cupid, which is one I steward, and then some other ones. And I was like, you know, we ought to make these file formats the same across these different projects. It'd be nice if there was an export button, et cetera. And then I had an opportunity with these guys. Um, and is this big enough? Can you see my screen or should I turn on the present mode? I can see it fine. I don't know if anyone else would appreciate it fully presented. Let's see. Will this Looks good to me. Okay. Okay. Well, I can try that. Um, hopefully it'll behave. So then um, I kind of had this opportunity uh, to work with Renee Kriegler right there at the top uh, and Paul and Johannes um, and what we were interested in was marrying up some of these open source relevancy tools that were out there with some of these tools that um, were good for optimizing e-commerce search. And so we were brainstorming and we said, oh, we should try and make a stack. And I think this is a classic example of what I like to call conference driven development because we put the talk proposal in, it was accepted. And then it was like, uh oh, uh, what are we going to show? So uh, there was sort of a mad sprint uh, towards uh, for, for Mices of putting together this, what ended up being called Chorus, which is a open source tool stack for e-commerce search. Now, because Renee's an e-commerce guy, Paul's a e-commerce guy, Johannes is an e-commerce guy, that's why we called it towards an open source tool stack for e-commerce search. Honestly, I think it's applicable to pretty much any kind of search at this point, but we do have ideas of this open source tool stack is going to become something um, uh, that sort of has best practices for lots of, for specifically to e-commerce search versus some other domains. Um, but I think that there's a lot of ideas in here that you might find interesting. Um, this is towards an open source tool stack because this is not a baked, ready to ship, go to production, deploy into Kubernetes, boom, you're ready to go, right? This is a work in progress. And I kind of think of it as a signpost towards the future. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. So um, we think about Pete, who's the product owner, right? And uh, we're gonna talk a little about, about Pete and he's just, gotten hired as the product owner for search at a new company. And you can see the business guy on the left is like, make our search better, build me best in class search. And Pete's like, yes, great challenge, thanks. I'm gonna go make that happen. And, you know, I think that, you know, as anyone, you may, this may look very familiar, right? This is what we often experience when we embark on a big new search effort, right? The, there are reasons that we're doing that. Lots of complaints about search, search sucks. Um, and typically if we're gonna be investing in search it's because if there's a return, right? We can sell more, great advantage, right? These are all reasons why we might wanna own our own search, you know, why we would invest in search and why it can drive a lot of things. Kind of back to, you know, why would Apple be investing in search? And so, you know, one of the things is that, you know, we always have that buy versus build question, right? Just in our chat, we talked about, you know, there's products out there like Fusion, there's open source alternatives, which way do we want to go? 
Um, and, you know, for some organizations, they think, you know, it's critical to them to own their search, right? Owning their search is what's going to give them their competitive advantage. But what we see is that for so many organizations, you want to do the things that separate you from your competitors. And that's the things down below, learning to rank, domain specific ranking queries, personalization. But to get there, we have to do all those things in that red box, right? We need operations ready. We need a results page, filters, autocomplete. One of the challenges I think in the open source world today is that we give people these wonderful technologies, solar, elastic search, even Vespa, wonderful technologies, but you have to assemble everything yourself. And most search teams don't necessarily have already the years of experience to do that. And I feel like we tend to spend too much time doing all the little things to before we can get to the differentiating things. And I think this is what leads a lot of organizations to decide to build, buy their own search, buy a search solution, is because they can't spend all that time building from scratch. And so this is kind of what we're interested in dealing with. So we want to know, hey, how do we speed things up? How do we do the hot stuff? Especially because we know that search quality correlates with money earned. And, you know, Pete's been hired by this Chorus Electronics. That's our sort of made up web store. And so, right, what I'm offering to Pete is open source software components that are all working together. So those are the sort of six projects right now that we blended together into a chorus of amazing relevance. Um, are you all familiar with all those tools? Maybe, maybe not. I'm gonna show them briefly working together. So Cupid is a relevancy tuning tool um, that I steward and Dan's contributed a lot to. Uh, Blacklight is a sort of make your own web UI kind of thing uh, um, that gives a quick front end. Uh, RRE is sort of an at scale regression testing tool. And then Quirky is a rules library uh, and we could have an entire meetup all about how Quirky works. Um, any of you all worked with Indeca? Yeah, I certainly yeah. have seen Indeca's yeah. technology in the yeah. past. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I think what made Indeca so compelling back in its heyday was its sort of really rich ability to boost and up and down and you know manipulate the search rule uh, the search rules. Well, Quirky is sort of a takes those ideas but did it in an open source fashion and brings that very rich quirky sort of stands for query rewriting, uh, a very rich query rewriting capability. So we could do an entire presentation on that. I'm not going to do it today, but I'm just kind of touching on it. Uh, and then SMUI, the search management UI, is a tool for managing all these rules. So, and then obviously we currently have Solar as the search engine under the covers uh, that's hooking these things together. So Chorus is a distribution of these individual best of breed open source projects, but brings them together into something that you can use. So I'm going to walk you through, um, you know, uh, looking at some bad search results, and then we're going to improve them. Okay. So let me see, uh, escape that. So, all right. Let me get my screens laid out here. So uh, Quirky is on GitHub and there's a quick start command that fires everything up. I'm not gonna do that, but I am gonna start out by showing you our e-commerce store called Chorus Electronics. Okay, am I? Making me nervous. There we go. All right, so here's our Chorus Electronics store. 
and uh, we're using an open source data source uh, from a project called IceCat that collects a lot of um, manufacturer data and open sources some amount of it. And so I went ahead and I did a query for Notebook. And this whole project here is called Blacklight and it gives you just sort of this very simple UI looks like any other sort of e-commerce store. I've got my facets, right? I've got lots of HP products, a lot of Targus products, Lenovo. Um, you know, there's my query. I've got some autocomplete in here as well. Uh, and I did a search for notebook. What do you guys think about these search results? Are they good? Are they bad? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. You, you, right? you, you are not yeah. steering them well to the products they're interested in. Yeah, they're, they're pretty bad. Let's go look at laptops. Uh, a different set of results and also pretty terrible, right? At first I was like, oh great, a laptop. And then I read the description, I'm like, oh, it's a screen protector, right? This is all pretty awful. So we all, just from this, have an intuitive understanding that our search results are bad, right? We know that they kind of suck, but we don't right now have any way of measuring and putting a quantitative value on these search results. We know they're bad, but we couldn't really like, how would we explain to anyone else how bad or how good this is? So let's go ahead and talk about our next component in the Chorus stack, which is Cupid, which is a tool for gathering search, uh, gathering data about the quality of our search. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a case and feel free to stop me if I'm moving too fast or you have a question. And I've got my local host, colon 8983 slash solar e-commerce slash select. Make sure it's responding. Yep. All right. And all right, we're going to go look at some search results. So I'll bring up title. Our prime, our ID is the, that's the ID. Uh, let's see. Let's grab some more attributes, like maybe a thumbnail, a couple others. All right. And what were our queries that were offending us? Laptop and notebook. Awesome. So here we go. By the way, Dan, it's back. <laughs> this, uh, so what core, what Cupid is doing is taking my search queries and bouncing them off of my solar. Here you can see them. And let's see, uh, we're going to use NDCG at five as our rating scale. Okay. Uh, and you can see this little frog. My kids uh, came up with it that says hop to it. There are unrated results. So the idea here is I can turn to any of you all as you know my merchandisers and be like, is this a good result or not? Irrelevant, poor, meh, good, or perfect. That's actually a pretty irrelevant result, right? Yep. HP notebook quick doc. <laughs> There's uh, Pupsy, Pups downstairs barking. Sorry about that. So we can go ahead and. Sorry about that. Uh, neighbor kid at the door. So there we can go through and we can rate these. Now, because rating, as we all know, making judgments is kind of painful, I've gone ahead and already done it for you. So I'm going to go ahead and import in some ratings. There we go. Import. There, you see the little frogs went away. That means our data is all rated. So now I have sort of a good news, bad news story. The bad news is on a scale of zero to one, because we're using normalized NDCG, we have a 0.14 on both of these, as in pretty much everything here is irrelevant, right? These are just terrible results. The good news is we actually have a number, 
right? We have a quantitative number that we can measure. Hey, how are we doing? Okay. So, um, and so let me go ahead and rearrange my screen a little bit into two browser windows because I like to have the web store on the left and the search engine on the right. Here we go. Can everybody see that? It's kind of squeezed in. It's just a little tight to have everything in there. And you see I've got my query laptop on the left. There, everything matches up. So this means I'm measuring things in Cupid the same way as everything looks over here, okay? So let's see if we can't improve some of these search results. So fortunately, we have our, our next component, which is called SMUI, the search management UI, which coupled with Quirky allows us to do some query rewriting active search management. Now, in some environments, the idea of writing rules and doing active search management is sort of anathema. But in the e-commerce world, it's pretty common to say, hey, if I can improve the quality of these search results through adding some rules and I can see conversions go up and drive more money, then it's well worth it. So uh, let's go ahead and let's see if we can't improve that. Um, so uh, we were looking at uh, notebook. Let's go start with notebook. Let's see if we can't improve it. Uh, so I'm gonna add, uh, give me one second. Let's make sure I'm starting out from scratch. All right, so there's my notebook query. So I'm gonna add a query. So the way uh, Quirky works is that I have a set of different rules that get applied to the query before it hits the search engine. And so I am going to go ahead and I'm going to add a down boosting rule. And I'm going to down boost on, well, I'm going to start out with, I'm going to, what, what, what products do we have in here? I'm going to down boost on, Nope, uh, on, on, on stands. And so you can see that I'm putting a relatively heavy down boost. Save that. And this is all integrated so that my rules files get pushed out to Zookeeper, which goes to all my solar cloud nodes and, you know, rolls it all out. And then over here on my web store, I'm going to switch to my quirky algorithm because I obviously want to be able to compare them. And I'm going to rerun my notebook search. Hey, that, that, that looks better. Well, I don't know if it looks better, but it looks different, right? I got rid of that stand, but I'm still not really solving. Um, I'm still not solving the fact that these are still notebook accessories. So one of the things though, that I noticed when I looked earlier is that I actually have an attribute for a product type. So I'm going to go ahead and try and up boost on the attribute the product type field. And I'm going to up boost on the word notebook. Go ahead and save that. Push that out to solar. All right, now let's see how we're doing. I'm going to rerun the query. And this is basically what life is like a search indizer. Hey, th does that look better? Oh yeah. Right, those, those are actually notebooks. Excellent, okay, that was great. Uh, all right, what was the other query that we were having bad luck with? Laptop? Hmm, we still have bad results for laptops. But in our e-commerce, in our Chorus Electronics, a laptop is basically a notebook. So let's just go ahead and make a synonym, undirected. So laptops are like notebooks, notebooks are like laptops. Go ahead and push that back out to solar. Do, 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 there we go. All right, let's see what happens with our laptop query. Uh. Laptop. Here we go. Hey, 
Hey, there we go, right? Now we're looking at laptops. Excellent. So now our laptop query and our notebook query both are returning better results than what we had before. Um, so we can go ahead and go and, you know, provide some detail. Um, you know, uh, need to better target what a notebook is by using the product type. And one of the things that we're interested in doing, as you can imagine, as you create lots of rules, is we want to collect more information from the merchandisers about why they're creating the rules so that at some point we say, hey, we have you know, a hundred rules that are all trying to do the same thing, maybe that's when we need to go and do some sort of improvement in our core algorithm. So that all was great, but how much, right? We now want to go back and we want to talk to our business owner or our merchandiser and say, how much did we improve search? So we'll go back to Cupid and you remember that our search results were really bad previously. I'm going to go ahead and I'm gonna tell Cupid, I wanna run all my queries again, but now I wanna run them against the quirky based algorithm that I have in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and rerun my searches. And look at that. While I have some unrated documents in here, all the, I, most of my documents are all highly rated documents. Oh, I'll go ahead and I can even grade some of these. As you can see, this is the challenge in this is that I have to have very deep judgment lists to make this useful. But you can see there, I improved my search. So, so that's fantastic, right? Now, one of the things though is I might have relevancy tuned just these two queries, but I might want to regression test them against many, many other queries. Um, and Cupid does a wonderful job for what, Dan? It's like 50, up to 50 queries in a case. Somewhere around that. The limitation is that it's running in the browser. So eventually that's not feasible, really. Yeah, to, to, to mess around with it, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, um, so we, you know, typically, it, you know, you're going to improve your search results, but then you want a regression test against everything else. And that's where Rated Ranking Evaluator is a great project. So Rated Ranking Evaluator um, does it at scale. So I'll just bring up the empty console. Oh, I guess I already ran. Okay, this is from before I improved my search results. So the way Rated Ranking Evaluator works is it works in sort of a script-based offline fashion. But fortunately, we have it all integrated into, into Chorus. So pardon me while I go to a, a, a terminal window. Let's bring that over here. Is that relatively visible? Looks good here. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is run this command. And what this is saying is I want to have RRE go and evaluate my search results. Now, I only have those two queries in it, but RRE is designed to do hundreds or thousands of queries. So here you can see it just re really quickly ran. Um, and it has the advantage of it's doing it not in a browser, but you know, in a proper multi-threaded Java application runs at scale. So I run that. And then it has a number of different reporting formats. I can get a spreadsheet. I can update my web dashboard, which is sort of a static view of the data. So I'll go ahead and rerun that here. And there we go. So in this dashboard, what you can see is that while my precision at 10 metric from version one to version 1.1 didn't get better, and honestly, I'm not actually sure why I've got this, my NDCG at four and NDGC at 10 scores both went up.
So rated ranking evaluator lets me do a broad variety of different um, search nerd metrics, DCG, NDCG, precision, ERR, MRR, all of those can be added in here, whereas Cupid really only does one score at a time. So that is basically the life cycle of what, um, that's kind of the life cycle of what uh, Chorus has built in. And all of that comes right out of the box with a single command. So um, let me see, so. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so what did I want to say? Uh, so, so out of that, um, you know, so to kind of sum the, that up, the quirky library, um, it could be an entire talk by itself. It's a really powerful talk, uh, library. Um, Renee Kriegler has been working on it a lot and it provides a lot of the logic in chorus that makes it valuable. There's some companies that are using it. Um, lots of European companies, Walmart Labs. Um, I suspect that we will see a lot more logos on this slide uh, over the next six to 12 months um, as it gets a, uh, more exposure. And uh, I don't actually wanna go through the slides of how, hmm, I thought I deleted these. So that's where I want to be. I think I deleted those slides out of the wrong deck. So uh, Chorus is all about getting all of these relevance and e-commerce optimization tools working together. Um, and you know, we know that in the e-commerce world, you know, optimizing search leads directly to additional revenue. And we want to we're reduce the gap. Uh, so a lot of open source search engines, Solar and Elasticsearch, aren't really meant for the structured data that is predominantly used in e-commerce. They're really meant for unstructured data. Um, they can be used it. And so with Chorus, we're going to kind of ship out of the box a search engine that's set up for that highly structured data. Um, we want to reduce the amount of time that it takes for a search team to get everything kind of working and to a base level of capability, um, make it more on par with the commercial search engine. And, you know, we're, we want to kind of solve a lot of the problems or use cases in e-commerce search. There's sort of a list of them. So uh, we're trying to make these, make Pete's life easier. Um, and the goal, we have this chorus project, which is this open source stack. And then quirky.org is a umbrella project that's trying to bring together a lot of different sort of e-commerce oriented projects that might be useful. So it's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, and so we're kind of figuring out what is the community process. A number of different organizations have said, hey, we have this really interesting library or source code we'd like to contribute. What does that mean? Um, today, um, you know, today at the heart of Chorus is a solar search engine, but it could be Elasticsearch just as easily. Um, and there's some movement and interest in uh, migrating Smooey and Chorus over to Elasticsearch as well. Uh, one of the things we're interested in is understanding if Chorus would work with a lot of different types of organizations, uh, both e-commerce and not. Um, and one of the things I'm very interested is sort of showing a smooth path from taking a Docker Compose, fire up everything on my laptop to we sort of have ambitions that you could take the same project maybe deploy it in Kubernetes and be ready for production. So that's what we're doing. So, and there's some links um, if you want to kind of find out more. So that's me. Terrific. Thank you for that. So. A lot of information in there. So I'm curious, Eric, in terms of engaging with this technology, um, 
do you approach it from the perspective of you look for kind of the head queries, the most popular queries, concentrate there first, and then work your way down to the long tail? I'm curious on what your plan of attack is when you're first working with an e-commerce site. They probably have yeah. their, their, their pain point queries, I'd imagine, when you first have mm -hmm. a conversation. So one of the things is what we don't necessarily yet really have in Chorus is online analytics yet. And that's going to be a big thing that we're adding next is kind of a big hole. It's sort of a blind spot. So the part that most people already know, though, is their most common queries, right? Yep. And so, especially in this sort of active searchandising approach, right, with these tools like Quirky and Smooey and that life cycle that I just showed you, you tend to focus on the head queries first because they're the most common and the easiest to deal with. Um, but one of the things that we know is that the tail queries in e-commerce are where your money comes from. Because that's when pe you know, people who are ready to buy are not typing in a query like TV, notebook, or laptop. When they're ready to buy, they're typing in you know, Lenovo, a model number, 16 GB of RAM. You know, they're very much more specific when they're ready to buy. Um, and so right now, we don't have particularly good tools for optimizing the long tail um but that's where we're going uh so yeah i think that the little life cycle that i just kind of showed you is really optimized around let me go fix your head queries which makes sense because you got to start there to fix, right? those, are the, yeah. those are the entry points into the site right and yep. to your point, when you get someone who's knowledgeable, then they're going to get to the long tail. They're going to right. fully qualify what it yeah. is they're looking for. Yep. And I think that what makes Chorus specifically really valuable is if we can get the sort of analytics in place so that you really understand what of your traffic is at the, at the discovery stage, the filtering stage, or the ready to purchase stage. Because I think you you know you're going to want different kinds of behaviors. So and how how would engagement change or enhance what we're doing here with the rules? And and what I mean is, mm -hmm. um, if let's say you had a new product announcement and that product is getting a lot of uh, activity, it's moving the needle. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious from a strategy perspective. Um, is there a place for getting a feedback loop which would react to the the quick uptick of the yeah. product introduction? So one thing is, I'm going to answer a slightly different take and then maybe try to get back to yours, is if I have a very general purpose query like notebook, this actually, if only it had a few notebooks in here, is probably a better result than the other one because it would show the diversity of products. And I might be able to say, you typed in notebook, what did you mean? And they immediately pick a brand. You know, imagine that these facets on the left, which I know I know nobody ever clicks facets, imagine the UX was a little better, but we could get much better understanding of what people were looking for, right? So if it's a very broad term, diversity and more variety in our search results, right, would be better. And so I think that there's a case to be made that these results actually, yes, while they're all exactly a notebook, a user might be like, oh, but I, you know, I was, I meant something else and we don't have enough context. So more diversity would be good. But if that they're putting in something more specific, we want to get more targeted. And I think that new products and more like, options that might distract the user makes more sense if they're earlier in the buying funnel but the yeah. later they are in the buying funnel about all you want to put in front of them is a buy today and you'll get 10 percent off you know more much stronger call for conversion if they're at the thinking about purchasing uh but you might do more interesting did you know we have this or this is the trending product if they're earlier in the purchasing funnel. 
Got it. Yep. yep. So none of that is baked at all into here, right? Uh, and that's the, but that's kind of what we want to get a baseline a distribution of search for so that people can really start thinking about those things instead of fighting with, you know, how do I make an autocomplete, right? And this one isn't even the autocomplete I like, right? I want the autocomplete that, you know, the Home Depot example, that's the one I want to be showing there. We're not there yet. Right. So. And, and Home Depot is rule-based, just like you're showing here. They mm -hmm. drive off of rules. So your yep. model here is not dissimilar to what I understood their internals to be. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Questions yep. from those of you who have joined us. The GitHub project is here. Zach, do, do you have a Docker? Do I see Docker there? There is. So this whole thing. Thanks for that. Yeah, it is. So this whole thing is written. So we have this idea of katas, and um, we have two of them. One is setting it up, and one is the what I just showed you, optimizing a query. We have a couple more in draft uh, that are getting added, which are going to like teach you how to solve a common e-commerce problem. So we'll be adding those. Uh, this whole thing is based around, there's a Docker Compose file right here that fires up all these different projects. So it's just kind of a long thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I can show you. I'll just fire it up right now. So there you can see all the services being shut down and all of them starting. And what's really been interesting about doing this is it's helped me understand where the rough parts are in all these projects, and then giving me a chance to go back and try and fix them and optimize them, right? So one of the things I didn't show you in Cupid is like we added this ability to export your data directly into the format that Rated Ranking Evaluator uses. We added a, hey, you have a whole bunch of judgments in Cupid. Now you can export them into the learning to rank format, right? Um, and vice versa, we can also, you know, now import ratings from different tools. Um, and so that's been a really interesting thing. The other thing that has been interesting about this project has been, it's given me a chance to think about like, how should you deploy solar? So David, you may find this specifically interesting. Solar has been around for a long time, which means it has V1 APIs and V2 APIs, and it has multiple modes. And like many open source projects, you know, every time someone has a question about something, you just add a new option. And one of the things that I'm interested in doing with Chorus is um, only demonstrating the good parts of solar, right? Being opinionated and saying, if you're using solar, this is how you should use it. I know that there's other ways of using it that all date from 10 years ago and was how we did things 10 years ago, but don't do it. This is the right way of deploying solar. So uh, that's an effort that's sort of in progress, but just to kind of show you, David. Makes sense. Yeah, so something like this needs to be opinionated. It needs to be more turnkey and come in a certain way. And Yep. So mm -hmm. like my quick start script and how it's documented, one of the first things we immediately do is set up security inside of Solar and we package the configurations and just use the APIs, right? Not how things have been done sort of historically. So... Um, yeah, so I have high hopes that this chorus will demonstrate like the best way to deploy solar versus like, here's all the options for what you can do. This is going to be pretty opinionated. So. Now I'm curious, Eric, when a product catalog evolves, um, mm -hmm. 
how does that change the flow that you've shown us? Would that be you would have different results that need to be classified and, and that's the starting point? Yeah, so one of the things that, um, uh, one of the things I'm actually working on right now, um, so let me show you a bigger example. So I actually have, uh, is this where I did it? Or did I do it in staging, sorry. Uh, hmm. Give me one second. Uh, so one of the things is building those judgment files is a pain, right? We all know that. Um, but what, uh, there are a number of different companies out there. Let's see if I remember my password here. There are a number of different companies out there that will, um, that will do the ratings for you. So one of the things that I'm actually working on right now is with this company called Superhands, where they do labeling of your data. Well, my laptop's running slow, right? So they'll do, you know, you know, there's the retail, you know, they do image annotation, they'll build judgments, right? And they do it at scale. And so one of the things that we've actually been working on is see this list of 135 queries? Okay, yep. Right? I'm actually going through and I'm going to rate 10% of them. So I'm going to do 13 of these queries. And I'm going to hand that over to them as a training data set, i.e. I'm going to annotate these queries. I'm going to explain why I annotated them the way I did. Um, you know, put notes in right? There's my notes field, tell them why. And then they're going to use it so that they can train their own humans to annotate these products in the way I want them annotated. And I'll export the data. They will suck it into their environment, their system. They'll do all 135 for me, right? And they'll multiple people rating them and they do a bunch of value add there. And they'll give me all that data that I can suck right back into Cupid. And so instead of having, you know, all these will then be rated documents and I will have like the top, I, I'm hoping to get the top 60 documents in each one of these rated. So I'll have a deep judgment list. Then as my product catalog changes, I can keep dumping the data back out to them and they can use their platform to do the rating or they can continue to use Cupid and just do the rating for me. So yeah, the judgments have to evolve as your data changes. Okay. And as you get new queries, right? Yep. But so you found a way to capture those updated judgments by tapping into a outside team, which greatly simplifies what um, the source organization would have to focus on. Exactly. Exactly. And they have a whole process and a QC. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been mucking around with is some notebooks to say, all right, here are the 13 ratings that I did, right? Your team, as training, they have to do some rating. How close did they get to what I rated? If there's a delta, was it my instructions? Was I wrong? Were they wrong? Let's figure it out. Let's all get on the same page, and then let's move forward. So okay. um, some people, some organizations, this approach just doesn't work for them. Uh, what I like about the manual rating is it feels doable without a ton of machine learning and all the rest of it. And it's not a bad way to kind of improve search a lot fairly quickly. And then at a certain point, these sort of manual ratings become less valuable. But my manual ratings also allow me to test any automated ratings that I start building, right? These explicit judgment lists allow me to validate any implicit judgment list that I build off of click logs and other things. So they continue to have value even when I'm not necessarily using them in a day-to-day -day basis. Yep, yep. So. Well, that's how you get the scale because I know we've had challenges where we've, um, when I say we, when I've been part of uh, larger uh, commercial search organizations, uh, 
trying to get that baseline of judgment in place. Um, yeah. That is a, it's too hard. Yeah. Right. It is. And today, today people send spreadsheets around and it's just a nightmare and, or you build custom proprietary software, which now you're maintaining and it never really does all the features. So instead let's use some of these open source tools that are out there. Um, they'll get us a long way. So, yep. yeah. I don't know, Tom, what do you guys use for judgment lists? You're so far ahead of it, you don't use judgment lists. No, I don't actually work on the, the retail so, search. Okay. Um, I'm All right. maintaining an elastic search, so I do lots of infrastructure and no okay. relevance. Yeah. So. so I've seen a merchandising team own this challenge for what it's worth. And um it uh it was a team and they had couple of years before we got involved. So they had at least a good understanding and some base rules. Um, mm -hmm. What they were trying to get to was how do you help simplify the maintenance of these rules over time? Mm -hmm. um, so, so more yeah. of, 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 of the automation, but stage one, they had to get stability and, and yep. get the relevancy where they needed it because we had situations where we walked in and they were all over the map. I mean, they had abandonment at like 25%, yep. which were horrendous, you know, yeah. numbers for an e-commerce site. And, yeah. uh, you know, so you got to get the base in there. And then when yep. you get the stability and you're holding on to uh, the uh, consumers that are there, then it's building on that and, and yep. getting the right uh, product in front of them based on the search histories. Yeah. So I'm working with these Superhan folks and they're very kindly, you know, going to rate these documents for me and make that a public data set that we'll add to Chorus so people can have like some judgments to play with. And, you know, we'll be putting out some other katas that are dependent on that. Um, but what's really great is you'll be able to like try out crazy ideas and not only kind of play with some queries inside of here in Cupid, but in the RRE product, we'll run this full set of regressions and you'll get a sense of like, oh, I changed that parameter. What was the impact, not just on maybe a query, a head query or a long tail query I'm interested in, but on all the other queries as well. Uh, what was that change? And so I think that's some, so I'm looking forward to getting that data set uh, sometime in October, we'll have the, the judgment list and we'll add that to the project um, with the other data sets that we have. So sure. there's sort of a, you know, where we got the data. So. Terrific. Yeah. One question on my mind, observation. Please. Um, when I've seen um, um, either the query elevation component used for boosting or whether it be synonym lists, over time, it ends up being, um, I've some, seen some of them grow long and very, very long. And then, mm -hmm. but there's no information about who, when, and why these rules are there. Yep. And so, and because of that, you feel a little bit like you're sort of I can't touch stuck. It. Like, mm -hmm. do I throw it? I'm trying to like, let's say you're in charge of refactoring, changing things a lot. And you're like, oh my gosh, do I ignore these legacy rules? Are they there for right. a reason? And, and so, um, like, hey, if there's a rule, like, when's the last time, how often does that rule even do anything, you know? Maybe, right. I don't know. And then you're left wondering, nope. <laughs> how often does the synonym rule even matter? Um, I just kind of hard yeah, to for some of that's those. exactly it. So I just restarted this. So now it's all back to bad results, not the good results I showed earlier. Um, but that's when the regression test, David's really important, right? Because what I, I, I often feel like, you could delete half your synonyms and your search results will barely move, right? Like, like it gets to that point. Um, but, you know, which half do you delete and how, you know, how comfortable? And that's why having this <laughs> yeah. really great regression test is valuable because, you know, if the aggregate number barely moves, then you probably didn't need them. The other thing, uh, so the, 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 the folks working on SMUI, um, so we have a little comment field, right? That's the minimum. But one of the things that's baked into here is like a whole bunch of LDAP authentication and stuff. And there's an idea that we're going to track 
who is making these changes and what they're doing and tracking changes yeah. over time. So there's a, not in this version, 361, but in the next version, there is a history, right? Annotations and more history and more workflow around yeah. why am I making these changes? And the great thing is if I see a, if I see a hundred rules that all basically look like, let me up boost on the product type field, right? Like kind of I'm showing you here. Well, after a while, you're like, wow, I'm getting tired of adding this for every query that shows up. Well, let me go ahead and solve the underlying algorithm. And yeah. this becomes my testing regime, right? Because I would expect to get, you know, if I take out all of these out of my quirky rule set and enhance my algorithm, I would expect the same results pretty much to come back, right? And so this is a structured way of gathering all of that knowledge that's inside of our our merchandisers' heads. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, sense. yeah. Um, and I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that we face in search is that people come into search, they work on the product, they add their feature, they leave. Someone else comes along, adds a feature, and then leaves. And nobody wants to touch it because you can't measure, well, what happens if I change it? And it must be there for a reason. Yeah, and that's why this whole, measurement whole of, thing is so important. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd love to have Renee do a talk on Quirky. Quirky basically replaces synonyms and the query elevation component. Really? It handles, it, it handles it with dynamic boosting? Yeah. Query rewriting. I mean, I hesitate to get answer your question now because I'm not sure I'm the right person to really answer it. Right. Yeah. Um, I can speak for the, I mean, I see my search results change when I click on him, when I do these things, but th there's definitely, it, it does some rewriting before the query goes to Lucene. Got it. And it's very much inspired, I think, by how Indeca works. Worked, works, so. Yep. Is there anything in Chorus to do A-B testing? Ah, that is a great question. So, uh, so close and not quite there yet. So did you know that there's an A-B testing framework in Solar? Did you know that, David? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, there is a... A-B testing framework inside of Solar. Let me bring up, you guys can still see my screen, right? Yep. Yeah, so check this out. I recently discovered this. Um, so in Solar, and I'm kind of going around the block right here. In Solar, there's this request parameters API. And what it lets you do is register a whole bunch of parameters, like a must match and a query field and whatever else you want, and give it a name. You can see in the docs here, like my facets okay. is this and this, right? And that's cool. What's really interesting is if I want to do A-B testing, I could have my queries with Quirky and my queries without Quirky and all the parameters that I need. And then at runtime, I just pass in parameters that look like, sorry, I, I'm, where is it? Where is it? The use params parameter. Yeah. You see this right here? Yeah. That could be my queries with quirky, my queries default, my queries some other algorithm. And then it applies it and runs the searches. Um, and, so that gives you, and that's very simple, all API based. I don't have to go in and change things. It's just really simple to mess around with that. Um, and so that's what I'm enabling in Chorus right now. Now, I think the other part of your question was asking like the analytics and you know showing me the performance and all of that. And it turns out that there isn't really much in the open source world around A-B testing. There's a bunch of abandoned projects. This is a, um, I can paste this into the chat. This is just a survey that I've been doing on A-B testing tools. 
So if you happen to know of any, please add them. But most of the open source tools that looked really good and powerful and would tell me which algorithm is doing and you know divvy up my people based on whatever criteria, they all seem to be abandoned. So um, obviously you could use Optimizely or I think Google, uh, Google Analytics now maybe has some more AB stuff in there and obviously like Adobe Test and Target. But A-B testing, uh, and I guess the last thing I'll, I'll kind of leave you with is this is how I think of relevancy. This is sort of the framework that I think about. Any farthing? I'm actually surprised you found that many A-B stuff out there, but I'm not surprised they're abandoned. It's sort of- There was a pop of them a couple like a of sweet years spot. ago. It's probably a sweet spot and what, what makes a good open source project. And I feel like A-B testing is on the edge of search maturity where so many search orgs just don't even, don't even get there. Mm. Um, but, but, but if you're big enough to invest enough in search to have an A-B testing, you might have enough search, you might have enough infrastructure period in your org to, for it to be too particular to the way your org does things. And it, it, it seems like, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know, like where I work, we do things a certain way, where, where Yelp works, I'm sure they do things their own way, whatever. It's, yeah. too, it's also too easy to build yourself. It's too, it's, um, you know, I think it's easy to build open. yourself and really hard to build properly. I mean, I just got this book, um, AB testing or trustworthy online controlled experiments. And it's really been interesting to read. Do you guys recognize, do you see what that animal is on the cover? <laughs> That's the highest paid person's opinion. That's a hippo. Right. And that's how we typically decide what is good search. We go and we ask the hippo, what is your opinion? And they tell us and we make that the best results. But this book is like 300, well, not 250 pages of content, 227 pages of content. And I think that it's one of those, the devil's in the details. Like I think AB testing is really simple until it's not. And we all think it's simpler than it really is. So, yeah, I don't think we should be writing our own, own A-B testing tools. But um, so to kind of wrap up here, um, Chorus kind of came out of this idea that I've been working on, which is I want, you know, I think of relevancy as a lab environment, offline, place to try out my crazy ideas, see if they work. And then an online environment where I have a promising idea According to my measurements, it's a good idea in the online world is where I actually see if real users respond to it and adopt those ideas and improve the search results. And so when you ask about A-B testing, that's still a TBD. Uh, Chorus has really just been focused over here in the offline environment. And again, it's because of those challenges, right? What A-B testing tool? What analytic solution? You know, do we just suck it up and make Cora support Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager and just use that because that's what everybody seems to use. So, so yeah, that's kind of where I am on that. Cool. Very cool. Well, Eric, no. thank you very much. No, it was I really my pleasure. appreciate what you shared pleasure. here. Yeah. Thank so. you. This was great. Yeah, well, looking for any ideas or suggestions that people have out there. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's been a, an interesting project. And it's been great to, you know, I've, I've met people who were like, oh, we were looking at Chorus. We were too far along to use it, but it was cool. So I'm hoping to meet some people earlier in their journey who may be like, yeah, this is exactly what we should start our new search platform on. Terrific. Well, I've recorded yeah. it. A general search conference might be a good, um, I was just thinking like, uh, well, um, you go to ApacheCon, I, I misspoke. I think I said general search conference. I don't mean that. I mean, um, uh, a, a general audience um, kind of conference where people aren't necessarily into search, don't know tons about it. Because if you go to a search conference, most people are gonna be well on the journey. Yes, that's a valid point, yeah. Um, I am giving a, a talk this a, a longer version of this talk at ApacheCon, I think. Yeah, ApacheCon. Uh, and you right. know, this fall, I'm going to be looking for some of those other communities. So if you happen to know one, I'd love it. You know, let me know um, because I am kind of looking for those. So it still needs some more maturity.
No, you've got a great foundation here. So, all right. Well, Perfect. thank you everybody for joining me on a Tuesday night. Really appreciate it after a long day of work. Uh, but yeah, this was great. It was great to catch up with people. Eric, thank you again. Really thank appreciate you. it. And I will be posting up the uh, recording here on the site. I should have it out probably sometime tomorrow afternoon. Cool. cool. Thank you very much, Al, for inviting me, and I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, Art. Cheers.